think about a guy who who had everything going for him. Went to Harvard, became a lawyer, joined a large prestigious law firm, married the perfect wife, had children, and guess what? He was going through the motions day in and day out, but it wasn't giving him what he wanted out of life. He was going through an act. He was acting on a roll. And one day, he couldn't get out of bed. He was just there in bed, couldn't get up, paralyzed. They got the doctors. They looked at him, examined him from head to toe. They said, there's nothing physically wrong with him. Get up, John. Come on, get up. He couldn't get up. He stayed like that for months, had to take therapy. See, because there was dis-ease, there was conflict in his body. Many times when life calling on us to change and to grow and to expand, we said, no, no, I don't want to hear that. No, 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 no. We resist that. So we can go back to that lifestyle of mediocrity. We, we resist that, that change, that growth. We go back so we can go back to sleep. What is the focus of your life? What is the focus of your life? In life, you have a critical option. You can take a stand in your life or you can follow the crowd. See, people who follow the crowd, their lives are not focused. They're not immersed in anything. People who take a stand, they're living a life that has some power, a life of achievement, a life that has some meaning. People that are taking a stand in life, they are consciously involved in a process to design a life of substance. People who are following the crowd, these are people that they're just doing what everybody else is doing. So that's a crowded road over there. They're following the followers. I want to talk to you about taking a stand with your life. And what are some of the things we can do that will enable us to give our lives up in a way that has some purpose and meaning that can be real for us, that can give us a sense of fulfillment, of joy and happiness and peace of mind. See, most people are bored with life. Most people feel that life isn't worth the hassle, that life is just wearing me out. It's boring. It's monotonous. I have nothing to look forward to. Here we go again another Monday morning, thinking about a situation where I had I had to give a lecture out in Los Angeles, California for Xerox Corporation. A part of what I do when I, my profession is doing corporate training. My passion is doing training with kids. So when I go someplace, I always try and arrange for a community group to have a group of young people together for me to work with them on a volunteer basis in the evening. So I decided to go into an area of Los Angeles to talk with someone about doing that. And they suggested that I come to speak at a community center right outside Los Angeles at Carson Community Center. And because of the, the gangs in Los Angeles, one of the young men that was coming there to organize it and his mother, he had a twin brother. And he took an interest in me because I have a twin. And his twin brother was the victim of a gang ritual. They brought in a new member in a gang and he had to prove that he was really with them and committed. And his job was just to select anybody at random and kill them. And he did that as this young guy was coming out of the store. So they told me, Mr. Brown, would you come over and talk to the teenagers here? There's a lot of depression and despair and hopelessness and people feeling powerless about the games. And bring um, with you some handouts and materials so you can do a workshop. And parents will be involved too. Would you be willing to do that? I said, well, I'm doing a full day seminar. And I'm usually just physically exhausted afterwards. How many people you say you're going to have? The week guarantee at least four to 500 people there. I said, okay, I will come there and work with them and take them through this intensive. So I came there after working in a seminar, totally exhausted, in that Los Angeles traffic. It took over an hour to get there. Got there, they only had seven people. I had an attitude. I said, you had me come all the way from Los Angeles after working all day? Just to talk to seven people. You told me over 400 people were going to be here. Where are the parents? Only one parent here. My time is valuable. I've got all this material that we've copied to do a workshop. And so I went on and talked to those young people that were in the room, the seven that were there. And I just gave them a little speech. And then I left. Went back to the hotel. That night around 3.30 in the morning, the phone rang. The minister that invited me called me and said, Mr. Brown, I got to ask for your attention for a moment. I said, what, I, what is it? Ken Yada, one of the young men who was there, wanted to talk to you. He was the brother of the guy that was killed. He'd like to talk to you. He's been here for over an hour, and I told him, please don't call you. But he insisted. Would you please talk to him for a moment? I said, yes, put him on the phone. Ken Yada, what can I do for you? He said, Mr. Brown, I haven't listened to your tapes for a long time. I've grown to love you and admire you. 
Among the things that I heard on your tape that you said you must deal with circumstances such as you find them. You came in this evening and I admit, no, we did not have the numbers that you asked for. No, we did not deliver as we had promised we would. But we were looking for you, the motivator, to give us some hope. We were depressed and we don't know what to do. We were looking for some direction. And you were so caught up in pouting with your ego, you didn't give us your best. I said, excuse me, I was laying in bed. I said, oh, let's see, part of what won't let us grow in life is, number one, we identify when we get feedback. We start taking it personal. Number two, we start to justify. So I became defensive, and I said, wait a minute. I worked all day. I didn't charge y'all a quarter for this. I went carpet material. I came over there. I was there to give a training for the people, and you, all y'all had to do was bring people there. If you don't do it for me for the next speaker that you have, at least provide an audience for him to work with. He said, are you through, sir? I said, yes. Mr. Brown, you said you must deal with circumstances such as you find them. <laughs> we went round and round for about 45 minutes. It took my ego on the line. I can't let this young boy out debate me. He was not intimidated. I used all the verbal gymnastics and examples I could. He would not bulge. And I said, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Give me a break. And he said, it takes a big man to say he's sorry. That night, after I finished that young man, I prayed. I stayed on the floor by the bed. I said, Lord, if you ever give me a chance to speak again, I don't care if it's one person in the audience. I'm going to wear that one out. I'm reminded of a young guy who was on a bus, a little young fellow, and some kids were picking at him, some bigger guys. They kept on thumping him on the head and hiding their hands. And so he got tired of them doing that, and he stood up so he would not be around them out of their reach. And they took him and said, sit down, and set him down. And he stood back up. He said, I don't want to sit down. They said, sit down. Didn't we tell you? They pushed him back down. I don't want to sit down. They said, sit down. And they held him down. And he looked at him. He said, you might hold me down, but I'm standing up inside myself. And what we have got to do is know that there's something about you. There's something about us. There's a power in you that regardless of what happens to you, you can stand up inside of yourself. I think that's what the port meant when he says, out of the night that covers me, like as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods there may be for my unconquerable soul. You have an unconquerable soul. Don't try to cut a bargain with life. Life is not Donald Trump. Life will not give you any special deals because you maintain a sense of integrity. You've got to do what you do because, not with any ulterior motives, that you're gonna get some special benefit or some special treatment in the universe. No, doesn't mean that somebody might not steal your car while you're trying to do some good for somebody. No, there won't be any special light around your car. They will take your car too. All the good people, you're gonna go too. You've gotta do what you do because that expresses who you are and for no other reason. They might not have a banquet to recognize you or give you a special little plaque and de dedicate a day in your name. No, do what you do because that's you. The next thing is dedicate your life to something. Dedicate your life to a cause larger than yourself. See, if you dedicate your life to a cause larger than yourself, you're not following in the crowd. See, if your life is not dedicated to something of value, and I like what Howard Thurman said, he said, the quality of life is often determined by that to which the individual is dedicated. If the dedication of the life is vague and diffused, the quality is apt to be poor and weak. There is much to be said for the intensity of life. See, most people are not intense about living. Most people are very casual about life. They haven't found anything to become intense about. So when you dedicate your life, you don't care anything about the odds. Somebody said, when the dream is big enough, the odds don't matter. See, when you dedicate your life, you bring on a special power. There's a power in you that people, circumstances, events, and I'm not talking about the physical you. I'm talking about the real you, the indestructible, invincible, perfect essence of who you really are that can bring a government to its knees, that can change the course of history. When you dedicate your life like a Nelson Mandela who has decided to sacrifice his freedom, all he has to do is say whatever the government wants him to say and then let him go free. And he can go to a foreign nation and say, I just said that because I've been in prison for over 20 years. 
And nobody will say, well, Nelson, you sold out. No one will say that. They will say, wait a minute. Nelson, you gave over 20 years of your life. What more can we ask you? It's okay. But because of his integrity with himself, and he's dedicated his life to break the back of apartheid and free his people, that when you dedicate your life to something, you bring on some powers in the universe that works through you to bring about changes that you would never, ever know unless you have dedicated yourself. Serena Williams is a young lady I really admire, and she blew my mind at the French Open when she won. She accepted the award in French. During the time she was practicing with her trainer to win, she also had a tutor teaching her how to speak French fluently because she said, I'm going to win this. All victories take place twice, first in the mind and then in the without. And that's what I want you to do right now. I want you to think about who you have to be because who you've been, Einstein said, the thinking that has brought me this far has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. That in order for this to be an explosive year for you, in order for your business to grow by leaps and bounds, you have to be a different person. You have to die to who you are now to give birth to who you must become. So I want you to think about that. What radical change will take place? What will be different about you? Think about it. What will change for you? What is it in terms of your attitude? in terms of the number of people that you talk to, in terms of your conviction, in terms of how you organize yourself, in terms of your drive and your determination, what's going to be different for you? Winning is a regimen. It's a routine that you get involved in. I have a habit of reading 30 to 40 pages of something positive every day. Most people never achieve their goals because their heads are filled with head trash and they are victims of what I call weapons of mass distractions. They're distracted by things in this world that won't take them toward their dream. Bring your energy level up. Yes, you can't be like everybody else. You have to bring your energy level up. You have to have a vision. You, you've got, it's a difference between having the vision and the vision having you. You can't listen to the naysayers. You don't want to spend time trying to convince somebody to do this business. A person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. You've got to be convicted in your spirit. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to achieve my goals. You've got to determine. You've got to say to yourself, I'm greater than my circumstances. I'm greater than what I'm going through right now. All of us go through something. It's called life. It's called stuff. Charles Udall said in life, you will always be faced with a series of God-ordained opportunities, brilliantly disguised as problems and challenges. See it as something that's testing you. Things are going to happen to you. Here, in order to have a fulfilling life, knowing that, that things are going to happen, expect the unexpected. Whatever happens to you, use everything for your upliftment, learning, and growth. Everything that happens. Use it for your upliftment, learning, and grow in the midst of it. Ask, what can I learn from this? What can I get from this? How did I end up here? There's something for you in everything that happens to you for you to learn from that experience. Look at it, examine it, analyze it, dissect it, take it apart until it reveals itself to you. And then get what you need from that and move on. But everything that happens to you. I have a friend, she stutters, and I said, are you taking any special classes to stop from stuttering? She said, no. I said, why? Because it helps my business. I said, how? When I go in to somebody, I say, now, if, if you're busy, I, I, I'll come back because I, I, I stutter. And they used to say, oh, no, 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 you can tell me right now. This is, this is my product. And she said, after she goes through it, and if they say no, she said, well, you didn't understand. Let me